Good morning, guys. It is Thursday, April 23rd. Um, today is our first video since before the break. Uh, last time I got to see you, it was on either Monday or Tuesday for our Zoom call, um, which overall was, was really nice. It was good to see you guys kind of in the flesh again. Um, one thing I want to say before we have our next Zoom call is make sure this time around, some of you guys were still in bed. Some of you guys were making pancakes or making breakfast. Um, I need you to be ready and kind of, you know, in the right mindset to be at school, even though you're at home. I know that's kind of a tricky thing to do, but um, I'm just going to let you know in advance. I won't be counting you as present um, unless you can show me that you're really ready for class and that you're being attentive um, to what we're going over. So uh, next time out of bed, not necessarily making pancakes at that moment. Um, in front of your computer screen and dressed. Okay, so that's the only thing I want to say for next time. But overall, y'all did awesome, and I really enjoyed getting to see you. So um, last time we were talking about anything, you know, material related was before spring break. It's been a little while, um, and it was the end of a man for all seasons. Um, so right now we're going to move past a man for all seasons and get closer to present day um, in our church right now, which is kind of you know the structure of our class is to come through the development of the church. Um, so Thomas More, we ended with Thomas More's death. He died in 1535. So we have to make a pretty huge leap to start getting closer to present day, because it's still quite a while, 1535 to 2020. Um, what I did is I went through um, some of the you know huge, massive chunks of history from that time until now in the church, just jotted down some interesting kind of key facts that are going to help us make those sort of big leaps and bounds um, to get us closer to present day. Obviously, I can only say a few things to get us to that point, but I'm going to share with you some of the things that happened between 1535 and now in the church. Um, if you're a history buff, um, this might be, you know, obvious to you, all of these things I'm going to say, but they kind of help, uh, you know, get us from the point we were to the point where that we're going uh, right now. Starting with 1535, Thomas More is um, obviously beheaded um, under the order of King Henry VIII. So we already know that. I'm going to look back at some of the other facts I've got j jotted down. You might want to write these down, too. I wouldn't be terribly surprised if one or two of them showed up on your final. Um, well, actually, I guess we're not going to have final exams, but on our next assignments, at least, uh, you might want to know some of this context. Um, the next thing is that around year 1700, um, the church continues to dispel and condemn heresies like Jansenism and many others using um, papal um, documents, kind of like the one that we're going to read uh, in just a little bit with um, uh, the, the the documents called Gaudete et Exultate by Pope Francis. It's starting to rain really hard. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Um, the next thing in 1789, this is the reason for the picture I have pulled up. The first ever Catholic university in the United States of America is founded. It's Georgetown University. So that is the picture I have behind me with the beautiful tulips um, and one of their beautiful buildings there on campus. So Georgetown, that's 1789. So Catholic schools, Catholic colleges are now beginning to pop up in the United States. In 1806, the Holy Roman Empire is dissolved. So no more Holy Roman Empire at all. Um, and then in year 1914, we're making big bounds here. But in 1914, Pope Pius X, um, who is now a saint, continues the church reform that we've been seeing throughout the years. You know, the church is never stagnant. It's always continuing to perfect itself. And so he continues the church reform specifically um, because he begins to encourage the church, like us, to receive frequent communion instead of just once or twice a year. So up until the year 1914, which is not terribly long ago, in 1914, Pope Pius X said he believes that as much as the laity, who are us, can begin to receive the Holy Communion, receive the Eucharistic Mass, um, it would be better for us to do that. And up until that point, we were only receiving very infrequently. And honestly, the role of the laity in the Mass was um, not like it is today. The laity in the Mass were kind of there and they prayed on their own. Um, and the Eucharist was kind of something that the, you know, the, um, the priest would receive. And every now and then, like on Easter and Christmas, um, we as a church would receive it too. And he said that, you know, if this is truly the body and blood of Christ, we should receive it as often as possible. And so now we go and receive communion at every Sunday mass for the most part, um, unless you're in mortal sin and abstain until you find a confession. But for the most part, we receive every time we go to mass, which is a change that happened in 1914. 1935, Thomas More is declared a saint. Um, 1939, World War II begins. Um, and then in 1965, 
Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council, um, that's changed a lot of things about the way that we celebrate the Mass, um, the involvement of us, the laity in the Mass and in the Church in general, happens, and it lasts quite a few years. It ends in 1965. And then in 1978, Pope John Paul II, who we all love very much, becomes the Pope, um, and it's the first non-Italian Pope that we've had in the Church in 450 years, which we talked about a lot earlier when we were talking about apostolic succession. This is a huge deal. JP2 um, becomes Pope, really shocks the whole world because he's Polish. That's 1978. And then the last milestone we'll talk about, 2018, the document that we're about to get into, Gaudete et Exultate, is published by Pope Francis. That was just two years ago. Pope Francis was made Pope in 2013, I believe, um, 2012 or 2013. And he is the first Pope of the Americas, as you know. He's from Latin America. And there you have it. So that's kind of a, a very, very, very brief overview of what goes down in the church. There's so many things we could have said. But um, basically, we have to start kind of getting to present day so we can get into what the church looks like now. All right. And so the thing that we're going to do today is we're going to do a quick introduction to the document that's going to end our school year. This is the end, um, the end of the material we'll have for the entire year. So I'm gonna go over here and share my screen with you. So what you need to do right now is go ahead and grab your um, notes. I know we haven't done that in a while, especially with A Man For All Seasons, um, but you need to go ahead and grab something to write with, um, or if you want to you know, listen to me and type into your Microsoft Office or whatever, Microsoft Word, and do your notes on your computer, that's fine. Um, but get something to write with. And so we're going to do a quick introduction on this document that's going to take up the rest of our class time. So it's called Gaudete et Exultate, and don't be, you know, alarmed by the Latin there. Um, it will make a lot of sense in just a second as to why it's called that. Um, so the Latin translation for Gaudete et Exultate is Rejoice and Be Glad. And the reason that we call it by its Latin name is mostly because of tradition. And it's actually pretty easy with exhortations and papal encyclicals to see why they're called what they're called once you finally get into them. And so we'll, we'll uh, tackle that in just a second. So this is what I want you to title your notes. Gaudete et exultate. The last thing that we'll do this year is look at some of the paragraphs of this document. I will say this, the document is like 45 pages long. We are not gonna be reading the whole thing. Um, Throughout you know the next two or three weeks, I'm just going to kind of ask you to read certain paragraphs, and we're going to reflect on the meaning of those paragraphs. Um, but outside of that, you don't even need to have a physical copy. I've already posted a download, a PDF download of this whole document, and I'll just tell you which paragraphs that you need to read as we go. All right, so obviously, like I said before, this was written by Pope Francis. Every pope comes out with different documents for the church, um, and the reason for those is because the, the, the pope will decide based on, you know, the time, um, the culture, what's going on in the church at that day, you know, at present time, um, he'll decide, you know, what is it, what kind of message is it that the church needs to hear, what kind of values or, um, you know, important meanings from the gospel do we need to kind of remember in our lives? And so he'll write a document for the whole church, kind of like a letter from the Pope to the whole church, um, kind of reminding us, you know, of these important spiritual truths to be aware of. So this one was written in 2018, and it's an exhortation rather than an encyclical. So it's usually a little shorter in length, and it exhorts us to do something. It, it begs us to do a particular thing. That's an exhortation. Okay, so um, again, like I said, an exhortation, it's an address from the Pope to the church so that we can newly focus on a particular spiritual matter. Okay, so this one obviously is about focusing on rejoicing and being glad, which is good news, right? Um, that's not something too terribly difficult to do. And why we are called to rejoice and be glad is what the document is really all about. Okay, so if you want to know what the document's going to talk about, the title is supposed to kind of clue you in, obviously. So Gaudete et Exultate means rejoice and be glad. Um, the very first line of the um exhortation, it's always going to be the English version of the Latin title. Okay, so the title is a little preview. This is the case for all exhortations and encyclicals. It's now pouring, so hopefully you can still hear me. All right, the first line of the exhortation is where you will find that. So um, let's see, here it is. Okay, so here's the very first line. Rejoice and be glad. Jesus tells those persecuted or humiliated for his sake. 
The Lord asks everything of us, and in return, he offers us true life, the happiness for which we're created. He wants us to be saints and not to settle for a bland and mediocre existence. The call to holiness is present in various ways from the very first pages of the Bible. We see it expressed in the Lord's words to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. All right, so if you look at the very first part of the sentence right here, rejoice and be glad from Matthew 5, 12, there's the title of the document. So even if you weren't sure what the Latin meant, you could always open the exhortation, look at the very first line, and you'd find exactly what the Latin is translated to in English. Rejoice and be glad. Okay, there we are. I can't play this video for you because then I don't think that YouTube will post my video if it contains another video, so I'm going to go past this. This is just about the Pope um, talking, you know, in kind of layman's terms about what it takes to become a saint and how all it takes to become a saint is to live our own lives as well as we possibly can, to live with virtue, even if we're not, you know, called into the battlefield of, you know, spiritual warfare, even if we are just students, teachers, even if we just live kind of simple lives, um, that's okay. We're all called in our own ways to be holy. So what I want you to do is to do a little bit of introductory reading on this. Um, here's your homework. You're going to read paragraphs one and two. We actually just read paragraph one. I want you to read paragraph two. Then I want you to skip to paragraph six and read six, seven, eight, nine. They're all pretty short. Um, so where you can find this document is under downloads in our uh, Blackwide class page. And so go to downloads, uh, download the PDF. You can look at it right there. Um, every single paragraph is numbered one through however many, I don't know, hundred something. So I want you to find those paragraphs for me, read six, seven, eight, and nine. And then I want you to go to your um, assignments on Blackboard and you'll see an assignment from me. Um, and I want you to answer these two questions in complete sentences. Who is someone you know based on paragraph six through nine, what they talk about, the middle class of holiness? Who are, who's someone you know in your own life who you believe is really and truly holy and that you know they're holy? And then secondly, give me examples as to why you know that. How do you know that they're a holy person? So that's an assignment that's very simple. It's due um, tomorrow, Friday at 4 o'clock p.m. After that, it won't be counted, so make sure you get that done. It's really, really not a difficult assignment, um, but you do need to read first, all right? Um, because the more we read, I will have little quizzes here and there, so make sure you're reading. But this is a very short amount of reading. It'll take you, you know, six or seven minutes to do it. And then your assignment is due tomorrow at 4 and um, I'll see you guys next Monday or Tuesday for your Zoom call. Remember, be out of bed, be dressed, and I'll see you then. Y'all have a wonderful day. Please stay safe. There are tornado watches until 1 o'clock p.m. for both Mobile, Fairhope, Daphne, um, everywhere across the bay. So be careful. Um, don't go outside too much. I'm outside right now, but I'm going to go back inside in just a second. So y'all have a good day. Be safe, and I'll see you Monday or Tuesday.